So the best way to learn CIDR is to practice it. And we're going to be using uh, break, smaller breakouts of CIDR networks as opposed to uh, larger transitions. So instead of sliding your subnet mask uh, to the left, in most cases, you'll be sliding it to the right, OK? You are provided the following as a reference from a current customer on one of a on one of the service providers networks right so this is what you know from one of the current customers on a service providers network he or she is using uh, 202.199.24.206 on a slash 24 network and you are directed to break out this network for more efficient use with cider to support smaller networks, specifically slash 28 ranges. Okay, using the CIDR templates that are in Blackboard, I need you to determine what the new net ID, usable addresses, the gateway and the broadcast address is for this client after CIDR is completed. Okay, so I want you to take this information and i want you to follow through the process we did a uh, class session or two ago and uh, i want you to perform the cider method to create smaller network segments with slash 28 ranges and uh, after you do that if this customer is sitting on 206, which network ID, which usable addresses are available, what's the gateway? How do you how do you change this user's network configuration after a CIDR method is applied? Right. You might wonder why are people so wasteful with public addresses. Because they don't they don't understand how to use CIDR effectively, so we want to practice this. I'm going to pause for about two minutes, and uh, you should already have copies of the slash twenty eight templates on your on your laptop. If you don't have your templates downloaded onto your you know local copy of templates in the references folder, you need to go in there and download them now. Right, everybody needs these, so you're going to go into the resources folder. And then for um, you'll have CIDR templates in here, and you're going to want to use the slash 28. So I'll just go ahead and pause this for a minute and let you work that up. And then we'll ask somebody to volunteer to share a screen and uh, tell us what you found out and what you did and what the answers are. Yeah, Okay, so on Monday we were talking about NAT. We said that a router, can everybody see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, the router or firewall can be used to configure, you can configure either of those to perform NAT. In Microsoft, you can use routing and remote, it's called RRAS. So, so if you wanna set up NAT, Using Microsoft systems, you can use or deploy a role called RRAS. In Linux, when you're working with routing and firewall functions, traditionally that was called IP tables. There are some newer flavors of firewalls that are working in Linux. There's one called UFW. It's uncomplicated firewall. It replaced IP tables, but originally, in the most basic Linux, you can set up IP tables, and that means you're going to be doing some routing and firewall functions, and there could be some NAT in the mix. Okay. Um, so I didn't mention Linux. I told you about Microsoft, but I want you to know about the Linux picture. If you see a reference to IP tables, it's talking about routing and firewall functions, and usually in the context of NAT. Are there any questions before we, we move forward? No questions so far. Okay. 
So one of the things that we want to do is to draw some sharp contrasts between IPv4 and IPv6. People start using IPv6. So I just wanted to read this with you. Everybody see that exhaustion date? Yeah. 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 So it's 2021 now. It's actually April of 2021. And this is significant because, you know, Cisco called it. They said, okay, we've run out of IPv4 addresses. They were exhausted in some places on April of 2011. Now you're going to get conflicting numbers. Some will say, oh, five years ago or seven years ago. It depends on where you live. Some parts of the world had a larger pool of unused IPv4 addresses. So it's hitting people differently. But for the United States, the first shortages started appearing actually 10 years ago. And even though we have 4.3 billion addresses, there is a lot of waste. Private addresses in combination with NAT have been instrumental in slowing the depletion. So NAT has helped a great deal. However, NAT is problematic for many applications, creates latency and has limitations that severely impede, impede or impair peer-to-peer -peer communications. A good example of this is something called double NAT. If you, if you set up a second wireless access point and you don't configure your service router correctly, uh, your service provider's equipment is performing NAT. And then your own wireless access point is connected with a cable and it's also gonna perform NAT. So you have two layers of NAT. So what am I saying? I'm saying you might have uh, um, you might have a 192.168.0. something coming from your service provider, and then you set up your own wireless access point, and that's taking a, a .0 something address. So your own wireless access point is receiving a NATed address, and then it in turn has got NAT set up. So when it automatically configures NAT, it says, oh, wait a minute, I'm sitting on 192.168.0. something. So I'll have to do something else. So I'll do 192.168.1. something. So you have layers of NAT inside, right? The bigger problem is the mobile devices. There are literally uh, billions of devices in circulation now. And we said that by 2025, they expect to have to support 50 billion devices. So it says that a lot of major ISPs and content providers such as YouTube, Facebook, and Netflix have also made the transition. Many companies like Microsoft, Facebook, and LinkedIn are are transitioning to IPv6 only internally. That's a process people called eat your own dog food, right? In 2018, broadband ISP Comcast reported a deployment of over 65% and British Sky Broadcasting over 86% for IPv6. The problem is, is that every piece of equipment that you have has to be capable of IPv6 and, and most things, are capable, you just have to enable it. If just one link in that chain from the back end internet service provider down through your ISP equipment down to your own equipment, if any one of those three levels lacks the ability to do IPv6, you can't do it. At this time, no internet service providers anywhere in the US Virgin Islands offer IPv6. If you're using AT&T and you've started to make use of 5G service, it's my understanding that there's some, some internet connectivity on the back end of that, that that does work with IPv6. But that's not internet service, that's cellular service. So that's a little different. I'm talking about internet service providers, not, not uh, mobile telephone providers, right? It's the internet of things though, that's gonna really change this, right? So 
Everybody's saying you got to move over to IPv6. Just think, 10 years is a long time. This has been going on for a very long time. Right? If you can't use IPv6, disable it. But everybody needs to start writing letters to your congresswoman, your, your, your elected senators, your internet service providers. Everybody needs to say, hey, come on, let's, let's get on IPv6. There are a lot of very important advantages when you move to IPv6. It's uh, one thing that's a, an innovation of IPv6, other than much better security, is this idea that it's a stateless auto configuration. So this is like APIPA on steroids. You don't have to have a DHCP server. You don't have to figure out subnet masks or which classes. It doesn't use any of that. Okay. There are so many addresses that basically every system configures itself. The first 64 bits are reserved to relate the network IDs. So the first thing you want to understand about IPv6 is that anything uh, that has to do with the first 64 bits of an address that's the network ID. That's a huge range of ones and zeros. And then the last 64 bits are used to identify the address clients. Okay. IPv6 uses two hex values for every eight bits. Uh, does anyone remember what we called half of a byte? So if there are two hex values for every eight bits, how many bits are represented by each hex value? So no. Say again. Is that half a byte? Yeah, it's half a byte. So if a byte is eight bits, what's half of that? It's four bits? Yeah, four bits. It's not a trick question. Each hex value represents four bits, right? And there's 32 hex characters. So if you want to create a, a fully numbered IPv6 address and you want a value in each one of those with each one of those characters, you're going to have 32 characters in a row. And each one is worth four bits. IPv6 can run on top of IPv4 infrastructure. So one of the adaptions that they came up with 10 years ago, oh yeah, nobody was running IPv6, but we need to start. So they started turning on and enabling IPv6 in a lot of devices. If IPv6 is running on a, on a system and, and there's no IPv6 on the router or on the network equipment, IPv6 can use IPv4 and tunnel using a pair of protocols. One's called ISATAP, ISATAP, and the other one's called Toretto. So here's the problem. If you have a device that's IPv6 enabled and IPv6 is not properly running, but IPv6 decides it's gonna tunnel across it's going to use the, the, the old infrastructure as a tunnel. When it sets up the protocols, this uh, ISOTAP and Toretto protocols, basically what happens is that um, you can have some connectivity through to people you don't want active on your network with those tunnels. So there have been some serious vulnerabilities identified when those features are active when users don't know they're active. So what's, what's the best practice? It's this adaption that was designed to help people transition to IPv6. It was actually exploited by hackers. And because of that, if, if you don't have a complete, if you don't have a completely functional IPv6 setup, then, then you shouldn't run it at all because otherwise these tunnels can set up and people can get into Kool-Aid they're not supposed to. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Okay. So I want you to think that the whole world realized they have to move over to IPv6, except most of the world didn't have network switches. They didn't have wireless routers. They didn't have uh, firewalls that could speak IPv6 yet. And so they, you know, all the manufacturers went, hey, let's, let's be the first out there. Why would manufacturers want to push this out there? Well, if they're the first devices to work on an IPv6 network, and it's a faster, more secure, automatically configurable network, then, well, people will start using your stuff instead of your com competitors, right? So they started putting out all these features and turning them on. If you understand IPv4 well, it's helpful to compare IPv4 with IPv6. And you want to understand the similarities and the differences. So Unlike IPv4, which uses the binary ones and zeros or dotted decimal notation, which we call octets, right? So every time you see a 146.226, 146 is an octet, the first octet, 226 is the second octet, 045 is the third octet, 008 is the last octet. Those are separated by decimal points. Uh, IPv6 uses colons, right, instead of dots. And uh, yeah, and they do have quite a few more. So there's 32 bits in an IPv4 address. There's 128. We've already told you this. Now, when you have a whole series of inline dots like this, there's shorthand. So a lot of times when people are working with IPv6, even though the address is huge, much of the address space isn't used. I mean, it's, it's ginormous. And so there's a network ID, and that can be a pretty small string of characters. And then there's a client ID, and that can be a pretty small string of characters. Because, because these are hexadecimals that have a lot more binary uh, information in them than, uh, than the old octets, right? The important thing to understand is that they tend to drop the zeros, right? So when they drop all these zeros, if they have a bunch of zeros in between two colons, it's very common to just do a double colon and then just have what's to the left of it and to the right of it with a double colon in the middle. That's important to understand. Under the right circumstances, a collapsed IPv6 address can look like a MAC address. Now, what are we saying? Well, here's another distinction that's important. I want you to see that there's four alphanumeric char uh, characters here. A MAC address typically has two with a colon, two with a colon, two with a colon, two with a colon. Does everybody know what I mean when I say MAC address? Yeah, that's the uh, physical address. Yes, it's, it's the unique physical address that's assigned to every network interface on layer two for frames, right? It's used to identify the sending and receiving addresses for frames. MAC addresses are, are the way that, that uh, network clients identify themselves on layer two when they're broadcasting on the local network. When they're interacting with the internet or online, then they're using IP on layer three. And that's where this IPv6 starts to, you'll see network information, you'll see this, and it's not uncommon for people to think, oh, I'm looking at a MAC address. No, no, you're not. And your first clue is, you have four of these alphanumeric characters, these hexadecimal characters together and not just two, okay? Any questions so far about some of these differences? No questions. Now here's another caveat that's really important to understand. The double colon can only be used once. So if you're going to collapse an address down, you can't, you can't do it twice. 
And why am I telling you this? Well, if you're creating software in an IPv4 world, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, you're dealing with a subnet mask, you're dealing with uh, classes of networks, A, B, and C. In some cases you have CIDR networks, right? And the thing is, is that when you're working, when you're creating network software or, or software that's network capable, uh, you, you have to understand uh, how, how a network protocol works. For IPv6, it's important to understand that when you're writing your code for an IPv6 environment, and why would you be creating new applications that are network capable for IPv6? I, I don't know. Um, you're computer science students. You take lots of coding courses with Dr. Boumedine and with Dr. Francois, and you learn all sorts of cool algorithms. And our last uh, module in this course will be creating network applications from scratch, which is really pretty cool when you think about it. The thing you need to understand is that if you're working with an IPv6 environment, you cannot have the double colon more than once. So this is not a valid address, even though we saved a lot of headache because we collapsed this huge address down to less, using a double colon again is a no-no. You can only do it once. So this is okay because this address only has a single double colon used. IPv4 uses a subnet mask. IPv6 does not use a subnet mask. I'm going to try to trick you on your next assessment by talking about the subnet mask for the IPv6 address. That's wrong. Okay? Don't 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 let me trick you. Here's loopback. If you want to test to make sure your network is working, in an IPv4 world, we already said that 127.0.0. whatever is loopback. Now, what do I mean by loopback? If I were having a problem with my network and I wanted to make sure that my IP protocol was working at least, I could ping. Sorry, I'm typing pong. 127.0.0. One or two or three, anything, any any number in the last octet is usually going to work. If I can ping myself, it means my IP protocol is working properly. It doesn't mean that everything else is there. Maybe the rest of the physical connectivity, the wiring further down the line is barfed. But I know the problem doesn't have to do with my software and my network interface, at least as far as the IP protocol is concerned. If I have IPv6 running, I can ping colon colon one. That's my loopback address. And yes, because that's a double colon, it's collapsing all of these continuous zeros. It means that there are literally 127 zeros preceding the one. Why am I telling you this? If you wanted to ping loopback on IPv6 and you didn't use this convention, you'd have to basically do this. Ping 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, there's 4. Uh, there's 8. Uh, there's 12. There's 16. You'd have to count out like 127 zeros. Don't get the count wrong. And then the 128th character would be a one. That's what you have to do. Or you can just ping colon colon one. So that's that's a pretty useful thing to, to know. The IPv4 uh, protocol basically breaks out two main portions of the IP address with a subnet mask. You know, the first one is the network information, the network ID. The second half of that IP address, the other side that's broken out by the subnet mask, 
is the client information. Does anyone need me to explain that further? Does everybody know what I mean by that? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, let's see, we're on page eight. When I have this subnet mask with this, right? So here I have two client addresses. I have a slash 24. I have this many ones in my subnet mask. It means that this is my network ID. Those three octets, 192.16.0. whatever is in this network with a slash 24. Slash 16, right? 23, this piece of it is the client address. In this client, I have a slash 16. This is the network identity. So I'm going to have a 192.16.0.0 network ID. These two numbers are the client, is the client ID, the client address, right? So, so it, it's always been a very simple switch. Always been a very simple switch with an IPv6 address. It establishes three essentials without a subnet mask, a global prefix that establishes the primary network of an organization. Now, this is something that's really funky, and I want to spend just a moment explaining this. Let's pretend that Apple. Apple Computers has purchased IPv6 public address space. Well, they actually have. Or Microsoft has. Well, they actually have. What about Google? Well, they actually have. What about Yahoo? Yeah, most of the big players have IPv6 address space now. What we're saying is, is that the global prefix, the very first part of that network address, there's 64 bits. That's the network address. The first 48 bits identifies the company. What am I saying? Apple has, uh, I don't know, I'm just guessing, I'll spitball here. Apple probably has 1,400 Apple stores on four continents in 27 countries. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Apple's IPv6 address ID, the first 48 bits, says, hey, this is Apple's network address. Now, the cool part is, is that there's a specific subnet at a location. Remember I said you have a, uh, how, many, how many locations did I say? Like 1,700 company stores? Let's say Apple has 1,700 uh, Apple stores in four continents on 27 in 27 countries, right? Each of those locations, that's the rest of the network address. I mean, you have a huge address range. The first 48 bits says, okay, this is the organization I belong to. Oh, and, and it's on this location specifically where, yeah, it's the Bangladesh. It's the Karachi. It's the Karachi um, Apple Store, and so you can tell from the last part of the network address range what the location is, and from the first part who it belongs to. So in that sense, it's almost like a MAC address. It's very specific, and then of course the last sixty-four bits is about the specific system or address. It doesn't use a subnet mask to do that, right? The first 48 bits of the network address is about the organization. The last 16 bits is here's the address LAN at that location. And the remaining 64 bits has to do with the client. That's the client identity. Any questions? Yeah. 
no questions. Okay. All right. IPv6 is classless. If you see a question about which class is this IPv6 address, it's a fake bogus question. IPv4 uses unicast and multicast addresses to deliver data to a single client or to groups of clients. Because the IPv6 network addresses distinguishes between an organization and a local network, multicast packets can be delivered to other systems locally or to systems across the entire organization. Now, this is just plain cool. I mean, when they sat down to devise the improvements to the IP protocol, they said, hey, you know, with IPv4, we have to work all of this uh, multicasting, this special address range, and we have to reuse those in certain areas. It's really confusing. So wouldn't it be nice if you just like had streaming video you wanted everybody in your organization to see and what did you put on it? What address did you use? Oh, your organization address, the first 48 bits. So you can you can deliver streaming media en masse to a site or across the world to everybody in that organization with IPv6. Wow, that's amazing. And unlike IPv4, which only had unicast and multicast, there's a third type called anycast. So if there's a IPv6 client nearby, this is like a, I think this is great and it's also a loaded gun. So IPv6 has this third kind of multiple peer-to-peer -peer distribution option called anycast. And it basically means, hey, if, if a, if a nearby client has it, then uh, just, deliver, just deliver it. It's like BitTorrent on steroids. Has anyone ever heard of BitTorrent before? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is really cool. Anycast is really cool. Unless there's a malicious payload and then, oh my gosh, watch out. Okay. On Friday, we're going to talk some about DNS. And we'll start with our how DNS differs for um, IPv4 and IPv6. So this is a good breaking point here. Are there any questions about what we've covered in IPv6 to this point? No questions. Going once, going twice. 